wasn't anything related to aviation that John didn't do. Yeah. That friendship started almost 50 years ago. And he's, <laughs> it was, those of us, those of us are old enough who went to Disneyland back when they first opened up, it was like a golden e-ticket. It was the most, probably the most exciting, interesting people I've, that have ever come in, into my life is because of John Lear. Mm -hmm. And he passed away here on the, uh, uh, I think it was the 29th of March. He was, he's been in ill health for a number of years. He's been in, you know, he, when he was still a teenager, he, you know, he crashed, he crashed two airplanes and he, and he shattered, literally shattered his feet. So his, his last 15, 20 years uh, on the planet, uh, he was confined to a wheelchair, but you know, or not wheelchair, but a electric cart or a, a walker. And that was just a sad thing to see. But we had his memorial service in Las Vegas on the 24th of April. It was attended by you know about 100 people, some of the wildest different types of people you could ever see at all gathered in one spot. And like his daughter said, you know, he kept a lot of those people away from each other. And the only time we ever, ever came all together was at his uh, memorial service. So John was, John was just a very, very special person and a, and a one of a kind. And some of the stuff he pulled, and we'll, we'll get into it in, you know, a little bit down the road a ways, but he's pulled some stuff that you wouldn't believe. And <laughs> One of the funniest things, I don't know if you can use profanity here, and if if, I, if, it, if you do, you can, you can beat me. But this is 1996. The F-117s have moved out of Tonopah test range. It's supposedly in caretaker status. And we had heard, we had heard differently that uh, there was stuff going in there. And I had heard that they had put a third perimeter around the flight line. So John Lair are at the fence line. It's middle of June, 11 o'clock at night. And we're sitting on our lawn chairs. We have we have generation one night vision goggles on. You know, they work just fine for what we were doing. And to the south, on the south side of the fence, and we're in we're on the public land side. And the south side of the fence is restricted area. And there's three armored personnel carriers, one coming up from the south, one from the west, one from the east. And they're heading towards us, their lights are off, and I stand up and yell real loud, hey, we're good guys, we're taxpayers. And all of a sudden, we had floodlights on us. John had three little red dots on his chest. I had three little red dots on my chest. And then I see this other pickup truck coming down the public land side and parked behind John's pickup. And he comes, you know, guy, gentleman comes around, he's in desert utilities. He has his hand on his nine millimeter Beretta. And he says, you're in a restricted area and I order you to leave. And I said, sir, I don't know who you are, but this is public lands and I don't have to go anywhere. I said, I am ordering you to leave. I'm captain so-and-so with ASI. And that stood for Advanced Security Inc. I said, oh, you're a rent -a cop You don't have jurisdiction on this side of the fence. And this guy's getting pissed and he said, Look, says I've been deputized by Nye, Lincoln, and Esmeralda County to uphold the laws of the state of Nevada and the federal government. You're in a restricted area, and I'm ordering you to leave. So I pulled out this handy-dandy map made by the federal government that shows restricted areas. I said, sir, if you look at the if you look at the, the base of the fence post where my buddy has his feet up on the bob wire. There's a USGS medallion that gives the longitude and latitude to the second. And we're in public lands, and I can be here for 15 consecutive days without asking anybody's permission. And he's getting more pissed as we go on. He's, and he says, I want to see some ID. I said, I don't have to show you squat. And he's getting more upset. And he said, well, I tell you what, you show me yours, I'll show you mine. So he hands me his ASI badge, and I said, sir, this is not a valid form of ID. I need something issued by the state or federal government. And he is getting more pissed. So he hands me his Nevada driver's license. I don't have my, my reading glasses on, so I said, fine. So at the time, I called Minnesota home. I gave him my Minnesota license. Lear pulls out his you know, driver's license. He lives in Las Vegas. 
he hands it to a guy on the south side of the fence who takes it over to the supervisor. And we, I, can, I can see him. Uh, we still have the floodlights on us, but uh, I, can, yeah, I can see the guy wandering over to the uh, to that particular uh, armored personnel carrier. He hands it to the supervisor and he turns the interior lights on. And this this is what, exactly what I heard. Oh shit, it's good all in there. Lights went off, red dots went away, and everybody dispersed. And they knew, but we knew that nothing was going to happen that night because it was good all in there at the fence line. So that's just one of many, many uh, stories I, I've done with the John Lear. And and I'm going to miss it. Something terrible. He he just he just put a. There was something about him. He had a he had a, a bizarre sense of humor. He you know you could think he is he is so bent out of shape at you. He just you know he 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 just assume pull a gun out and shoot you, get, put you out of your misery. He's cussing me up and down and whatever. And then all of a sudden you see this twinkle in his eye. I said, Larry, you sob. And then he let he had the best laugh. He let out, let out this belly laugh, and just. Just uh, he would just almost wet his pants. He'd be laughing so hard. So that is, you know, that is, uh, you know, the part, you know, just a smidgen of what John Lear represented to me in my life. And I'm, a, and I, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for him. I wouldn't have met John. Uh, I, I wouldn't have met uh, Bob Lazar if it wasn't for him. I wouldn't have. Uh, been one of the first persons to go up to the top of white sides overlooking area 51 if it wasn't for john lear i wouldn't have met george knapp from klis uh, if it wasn't for john lear and i wouldn't have gone to desert blast and seen what some of the crazy stuff that he and lazar did out in the desert i mean my gosh they one of the crazy things they did they had, they had a thing for 13 years until Bob decided it was getting too popular and he quit it. But we used to make commercial grade fireworks in his garage. I'm sure if it, I'm sure if his neighbors knew that there were 500 to 1,000 pounds of black powder in a, in a, behind a false wall in his garage, they would not have been happy. <laughs> but uh, they go out and they they blow up things they had fire machines they'd go out to a, to a, a dry lake bed and because it became so popular he wouldn't tell anybody when or where until about 24 hours before the event and he'd get up to 1500 people out there but one of the crazy things he did they went to uh enterprise rent a car rented a car put out took out all the insurance you could take on it to make sure if it got damaged it would be fully covered and then they proceeded to put it out in the middle of the lake bed. They had Thompson sub submachine gun, a 50 caliber you know, machine gun, and they just blew the snot out of this rental car. I mean, literally, they, they were using armor piercing, piercing weapons, so it was going through, it was going through the, uh, the engine block. The thing was just totally destroyed. And when they brought it back to Enterprise, they had it on a flatbed, and they brought it in and they unloaded it, and the guy comes out, what the hell happened to my car? And, and John says, I don't know. I said, we were, at a, we were at a function in a not so good neighborhood, and when we came out, this is what it looked like. But it is fully covered insurance-wise, right? And he said, yeah, but what did you do to my car? And unfortunately, I don't think there are any photographs exist of it. So, uh, okay. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interrupt you right there. This is good, okay. this is good stuff. Hey, um, I want you, we're going to, we're going to take a break. It's going to be about, uh, approximately three minutes long. I okay. Want you, I want you to go get some water, wet your whistle, uh, cause I don't want you getting hoarse in the middle of the show. And, uh, when we come back, uh, we can pick up where you left off and I can ask some more questions. I, I can ask some questions cause I haven't listened to anything. I've been, you know, mesmerized by all the stuff you've been telling us. So, um, Go get your water, and uh, okay. I'll be back. We'll be back in about uh, three minutes, and you'll you'll be refreshed, I hope. And, uh, All right. You guys are listening to The Other Side of Midnight. Our guest tonight is uh, James Goodall, and I'm your host, uh, instead of Richard, uh, Keith Morgan. And we'll be back 
after this break. If you're in, I heard a mention of one thing. The wine is essential is our club. 19.5. It's a hyperdimensional storage case. Treasure trove of outer space, our club, 19.5. All the data we've accumulated, the find here, titled and collated. Why don't you just drop on by and give our club a try? Dimensional, you'll find our credentials are fine. Club 